Hi, welcome back to uh, Shooting Country TV. I uh, hope we all had a happy new year uh, and a great time over the holidays. Today, we're just, uh, I'm gonna, instead of going around just sticking in one place, shooting squirrels on a hide, we're gonna have a bit of a run around and show different, a few different missions and just show you basically what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Basically, a day in the life of a squirrel ranger. There's a lot more to it than just pointing a gun as a squirrel and, uh, and picking a carcass up at the end of it. So, like I said, I hope you had a good, great new year and uh, follow me this way. Right, here we are in, uh, in Penrith. It's on a brand new permission. Uh, the member of the public contact has seen the grey squirrel on their land, which is all this area you can see. Uh, so I, I met up with a lady, had a walk around the land with her, and we uh, we saw three or four on that day. I've set a trap up, sorry, I've set a feeder up and I've set a camera up, uh, and we will be setting a trap up later on if the numbers are as bad as what I think they're going to be. Uh, but at the moment it's not quite right for trapping at this time of year and uh, another month or so we'll be onto it. Uh, so I'm expecting to see a few today. I'm expecting to probably see half a dozen. If we get half of those we're going to be happy and we'll just keep coming back and I'm going to wait them and, uh, and get them nailed off. Uh, but we're going to head this way. There's quite a deep stream uh, to navigate. It's quite slippy. Uh, and when I came down and fitted the feeder and the camera it was rushing like a torrent through there, so we need to be very careful when we're crossing that. But uh, we're going to be heading that way, and we're heading that way right now. Right, we've just moved down about 100 yards perhaps from uh, where we came into the field, and I've already seen one or two in the trees. The rifle we've got today is the Air Arms S510 Tactical. It's 2.5 FAC, it's well capable of taking that sort of distance. It's probably only 50 yards, but the problem is, in the field behind it, we've got some sheep. Uh, so obviously, last thing we want to be doing is putting shots anywhere near a sheep. Uh, so we're going to get down to the wood, get to his vantage point, and wait for him to come to the feeder, uh, and leave the sheep in peace. two squirrels in the tree, right above my feeder. Uh, and now I've got to work a way to get to my vantage point to overlook and to get a shot at them. Uh, the water's still too deep to get right behind it, so we're going to have to cross here, keep his movements down to a minimum, and get into uh, an advantageous spot to take the shot. Yeah, let's try and not get wet. Go a little bit closer now. I can see them up and down the trees. I think they're quite agitated because they've seen us coming. So I'm going to try and get myself into my vantage point and get myself in position. Probably give it 20 minutes, half an hour, give them time to settle down, and hopefully they'll be back in again and then we can get to take care of them. Um, I'm often asked how we uh, assess land for, for reds and greys and what the populations of both. It's quite difficult really. 
Uh, the initial alert to our reds or greys is probably by the public getting in touch with us. Let us know they've seen reds, which is a good thing, and let us know if they've seen greys, which is a bad thing, and then we obviously have to act immediately, get up here and get sorted out. Uh, the trail cam is one of our best bits of kit for this. It'll tell you uh, how many sort of, roughly how many sort of greys and reds are in their area uh, and what times they visited. In which case then you can plan around that, uh, around that information and you can get yourself here before they turn up or you can sit out all day if you really need to. But I find the information from the trail cam will give you like times and it's usually invaluable. Uh, really spot on, you can work your day around it. Uh, sometimes I might be here like 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, at this time of year in readiness to be here for seven uh, when they turn up at seven so that uh, I'm, I'm not moving about in the background so they can see things moving if you're there waiting for them you're on a winner the reds obviously just take notes of the reds army you're seeing and uh, just mark them down it logs into our logs and it logs into some sort of national database which is all run by the different red squirrel groups feed wise uh, lucky enough to have the the group actually supplies all the feed for the squirrels and we have a good mixture of monkey nuts, peanuts. We have a bit of maize in there for colour. The, the squirrels tend to leave the maize till the very, very last one. There's nothing else there. We have black sunflower seeds and stripy sunflower seeds. Uh, and sometimes on the feeder, I'll smear a bit of peanut butter on there, just stick them on to get them there to hold it. So they're licking it, biting it. They're not actually taking it to running away. Uh, and sometimes, believe it or not, a bit of aniseed oil, which gives a scent which the squirrels have become attracted to and become aware of. So when they smell that, they're aware there's feed going. Another little trick is when I'm feeding, or when I'm topping up, that's the sound you'll hear when the squirrels are actually taking feed from the feeder. And they associate that with, with feed, and they might associate it with other squirrels being on their feed or taking the feed what they think is rightly theirs. So just a, a tap now and again, walk away into the distance, get to your vantage point, which for me is like 35 yards over that way, uh, direct line onto the shot, and then see what happens, give it 20 minutes. I've been there uh, in some of the other permissions, and I've fed within five minutes of sitting down in a hide, squirrels on the feeder, because it's heard that, and it associates that with feed. So, to reiterate, intel from your customers, or from, it, from the public, or the landowners, or the, fa or the farmers, Decent trail cams, a feed point where they can come and feed, and good feed. Good feed is essential. Uh, different people have got different ideas what works best. For me, peanuts drives me into feeding frenzy. And if I could fill it just with peanuts, then I would do, but uh, it's nice to have a good mix. And they do like the stripy sunflowers. For me, it's the peanuts, stripy sunflowers, monkey nuts, black sunflowers, maize, in that order, which would seem to take. You'll find I'll come to these feeders sometimes, all that's left in it is maize. Another time you come in, it's all gone. Depends on the time of year. But uh, if I think if you stick to those basic ideas, uh, your squirrel hunting will be successful. Another one we've got. I can see three moving around in that tree. We've got there's that many what they call sticklings growing up the tree, written the squirrels, and they're stuck up there. That's two stuck in the tree now. A little bit of buzzard food. You can see exactly where it is, but you can't pick it out even if with a normal glass scope, you won't be able to pick that out. Damn it. 
week, right of anywhere. So we just have to move a little bit. It's, there's some branches in between us, and then the, 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 the scope's not picking the branches up in between because I'm focused on the squirrel. And it's just nicking it, it's just sending it away. But uh, that's three from that large redwood. Uh, got a funny feeling one's landed in the water, we heard a splash. Uh, the other two will be on the bank. We'll go and get those three retrieved. One's going to be a bit wet, and we'll. Uh, Hopefully, that's three in the bag for today. Let's see if we can see them. Can see one. Oh no, I'm hoping there's not two in the water. I can see one on the bank anyway. Well, we've managed to retrieve two out of three. I think two's up to going in the wet stuff. This is a, a big male, as you can see. A good one to get out of the action, so it might be causing any more havoc. Uh, I've just noticed there's a, quite a large tree down across the stream further down, down the line. I'm going to go down and see if it's got locked up on, uh, locked up on the log. Uh, nice to retrieve them. But uh, that's the hazard of this. You can see the bank's quite steep. I think it'll come out of the tree, reach terminal velocity, hit the bank, and roll down and in. Some of the branches are actually over the stream, which is actually looking at it now. That was the way down. Right, you can see it's obviously the deep pool, it's flowed down, and as you can see, it's got stuck in the rocks just down here. That's two out of three from this area. Right, just a few words on permissions. Uh, first started shooting with a 10 year old back in the day, back, back in the 60s. You'd be, uh, you just used to shooting where you wanted to, probably a little bit responsible compared to today, but we all changed and things moved on. Today you need permissions, even if it's a sub 12, uh, and it's the hardest thing in the world. Quite easy to get a gun, but getting somebody to let you shoot uh, your gun on their land is a hard thing, and you've got to appreciate that they're letting you do that. Uh, back in Derbyshire, I'd go around, I'd be knocking on doors just about every day trying to get permissions, and it was so heartbreaking and disheartening when you come home and you haven't got one and you just still got one permission perhaps. But you've got to stick at it, keep, keep visiting the farms, keep talking to landowners, talking to existing landowners and they'll pass on the good word and just as long as you're doing a good job you shouldn't fail you get in there up here is a little bit different as a red school ranger i'm getting people ringing up all the time because people up here are very aware of the the plight of the red squirrel and they've only got to see one gray squirrel and they're on the phone can you come and look at this uh, and i'll say yeah absolutely do you mind if i you know, if i trap or shoot and they're quite open to me doing whichever method is best for the best of the area Permissions is obviously it's more important than a gun because without a permission you might as well not bother having a gun. Present yourself professionally, eloquently, try and talk to people in a normal sort of fashion, don't try and speak down to them. Don't turn up with your camel on when you're knocking on people's door and certainly don't turn up with a gun on your bike just presuming you're going to get permission. Just talk to people like you meet them in the pub and just talk to them standardly and normally. Uh, and I find that'll generally work. But just, just one bit of advice is just never give up. 
keep keep searching, keep looking, keep talking, and keep asking. And uh, you two could end up what doing too, getting wet, retrieving a squirrel out of the river. Right. Right, that's uh, that's us finished on this new permission for a while. The wind's picking up, the rain's coming in. Uh, we've had six, seven today, there's six here, one we've lost, we had two land in the water, one's got washed away and gone. One was stuck in the rocks, which you saw. Uh, we had three from, uh, four from the first place, and three from, uh, three from the trees. Uh, and there's still a couple out there. Uh, they've obviously legged it when we went to pick everything else up. But I'll be back here to sort these out. Uh, the carcasses, people again, that, that, another question people are asking me, uh, what do I do with them? Uh, well, we all know Dave Barham, and we all know Dave Barham's mum, Rosie. Uh, at one time, he used to save all the carcasses from the airgun uh, headshot squirrels, and I'd taken them out to see Rosie, and Rosie used them in some fine cuisine uh, for, for various things. We'd be, we'd be having uh, squirrel carbonara, uh, and we'd also have squirrel sausage rolls. But generally these days, I, I keep them all and say, put them out for the foxes when I'm out foxing. The foxes love a squirrel. Uh, I've watched them through the thermal and they like sort of pick them up and play with them, toss them around like a, like a dog does with a toy uh, before they start uh, devouring into them. But yeah, uh, so all carcasses, everything's recycled one way or another. Uh, probably enough here to make somebody a hat. Maybe uh, can make Ollie a nice hat out of this. You can it's all too well. Is the time of year when we, we take his foot off the gas when it comes to controlling greys? Well, no, not really. Uh, the greys will breed twice a year. They can have as it's, it's been known that they can have as many five, six, maybe even seven, seven kits during the year, which is a lot more than what the reds have. The reds can breed twice a year, but generally breed once. Uh, it has been known for them to breed twice, but the greys will outbreed them, outfeed them, and outgrow them and outbully them. Uh, so really, there's no really good time to stop the grey control. And when when the greys become a little bit less active sort of August, September time, then it's time to start doing the supplementary feeding of the, of the feed for the greds. Uh, even though I might have got a land that's got no greys on at all, I've still got feeders on there and I'll go back in there and I'll feed the, top the feeders up the feed to make sure there's plenty of feed around for the reds to try and get them the best chance of surviving and overcoming the threat from the greys. So in short, the answer is no, there's no time to stop doing what we're doing. Uh, once you, you, you'll know yourselves, once you take your, your eye off the ball, you turn away from an area you've been taking care of the greys, you go back two or three weeks later, they're all back in again. I find that everywhere I go. Uh, very, very rarely that you find that they've gone completely. Uh, you might cut the numbers down, it might look like there's none been there for a good few months, but eventually they do come back. So no, you don't really want to be slowing down uh, with, with the grey control. Right, we've just got a feeder just up here, another, another, another stream to cross. Uh, this is a, we've got a feeder, a trap and a camera. So we'll just go up there, just check it out, make sure it's all all right. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next one. Right, this has been quite uh, a good little permission, this one. Uh, the woods itself is about 16 acres, uh, but it's up and down, so the actual total flat area probably near the 20 by the time you take the, uh, the inclines of each side of the ravine into, into account. When I first came here, there was no, no red squirrels being sighted. The owner had seen a couple of greys, asked me if I'd come in. Uh, it's come up to, I've probably been on here about eight, nine months now probably taking 50, 60 greys out of here and the reds are flourishing. Uh, I've got three of these feeders in, one here, one right at the very top and one halfway up uh, and each one's showing four to five different reds coming to feed every day. Uh, obviously each one's got a camera on it. Uh, you can see it's been, been touched a little bit but uh, just scatter a bit this round, top him up.
I'm not taking the camera out of. Uh, I'm not taking the card out of the camera. It's only been in a few days, so well, I will check to make sure the battery's in good condition. Yeah, battery's full. Good. The date and times, right? Yeah. Sometimes if you get uh, a bit of water ingress, you can find it flattens the batteries out a bit prematurely. Uh, so it's always good just to check it. Another thing I want to point out, when you get the trail comes, it comes with this sort of affair. It's sort of like a, a double jointed and to be honest, they come loose and uh, I really don't like them, they, you know, they come over about. So we started using now, uh, all the guys in the group, we use these vine screws and they're about a six inch, four inch, six inch screw with a, with a loop in the end, nut and bolt through and a, uh, a wing nut to tie it up and that works perfect. There's none of this moving about malarkey, that's fixed and it, it does not move. Uh, so a little tip for you there, if you're thinking about improving your camera work, your trail cams, bin that piece of junk that comes with it, get some of these vine screws, nut and bolt, wash it either side and uh, that'll take care of it. And uh, we'll, I'll get, we'll just get a close-up of that so you know exactly what we're talking about. But that is, uh, it's been a godsend. Right, just a little bit of tuition how these traps work. Uh, they're pretty straightforward, pretty simple. I use these, just a bit of plastic pipe to screw through it, and what I'll do with that, this is when the trap's not in use, but what I, what I want to do, I want the screws to get used to coming in here. So they can come in, that the trap door won't flatten down. The screws can go in, take the feed, go away, and they, they'll get used to it. Once they've left, like, left it like that for a few days, I'll take that away, and as you can see, there's a little flap in the back here, move that on, that holds the door in place. What you do, you put a bit of feed inside on the back. I don't know if you can see it from there, but the screw will come in through there, activate that flap, and the screw's in there. Now when these are set, you don't want to leave these set any longer than eight hours uh, without checking them. And ideally, you want to unset them at night because uh, if they come round late on, very early doors, you don't get here on time. You can have a red or a grey in there, and either even if it's a grey, you don't want it to suffer unnecessarily. So check them regularly, keep on them, try not to leave them set for too long, uh, and it's just just safeguarding the wildlife. Even though it's a grey, it doesn't deserve to to die unpleasantly. Uh, we can take care of that. What we do with these when they've got a squirrel in here, rather than shoot it, because obviously. The, the squirrel pox is transmitted by urine and, and blood. Uh, so if you shot one in here, you have blood all over the place. Next thing in there could be a red, and that would pick up, excuse me, that would pick up you know, the, the possibly infected blood, which is not good. So what we do with this, we'll get a sack. The squirrel will be in, you open the door up with a sack over the end. If I get the finger on there. Right, sack over the end. Like that, and then you open. Then you obviously, when the sack's in place, then you open the door. Hold that up. Sack's in place. Squirrel shoots out into the bag. You've got the bag. And dispatch it while it's in the bag. And you're not doing any shooting and any sort of bad things there. It's always worth disinfecting it uh, because no doubt it, it'll have messed in there. So that is another point where it'll catch, uh, pass on the disease. So disinfect them. Same as same with the feeders. Regularly disinfect them get rid of any urine, faeces or blood, anything that might be on them from the greys that will be easily passed on to the greds. Just keep it clean, give them more chance of surviving. So how many permissions do you cover across Cumbria? Oh, right, good question. Uh, I cover permissions, it's like one big massive permission because it all works under, under the banner of the Penitence District Red Squirrel Group. But I cover from Greystoke to Jombe to Ellenby to Lamanby, Skelton, Skelmwood End, uh, Lathes. That's, pro that's probably all the big, all the big names, the big towns area. There's lots of little places in between. Uh, I don't think how many square acres it is. I know uh, Greystoke's supposed to be 60,000, I think. So that's just one permission. Then you've got Jombe, which is a little bit smaller. So the amount of, the amount of acreage that I'm actually covering is immense. Uh, and there's a lot of running around to do. Uh, sometimes I'll be doing 50 mile a day just running around between permissions. Sometimes a little less. If I know there's like a, a big influx of grazing in one area, then I will sit it out in one area and try and take as many as we possibly can. Uh, but 
obviously that's not that's not every day. It's nice when that happens, but to be honest, I prefer to be on foot, prefer to be moving around. But permission wise, there's loads and there's there's, there's, there's various other smaller ones which uh, probably fall under one of the areas such as Lambeth and LMB. But there's like smaller permissions within that. <coughs> Little small uh, small farms, small holdings, people's personal even people's personal gardens. Where they got graze, I've got permission to go there whenever I think it's sassy fit or when they call me. Quite a few of those actually. So uh, they all add up, and it's all all makes the job worthwhile when you get to when you when you get to the graze. Right, this is another permission that uh, that fell into my lap quite nicely. Uh, a lady rung me up and told me that uh, she got a grey squirrel in her garden. Uh, and would I be interested in coming and taking care of it because she's quite keen on red squirrel conservation? So I. Uh, I said, yeah, absolutely. Go around. As you can see, well, as you will see, it's a little bit more than just a garden. It's some sort of mansion house with like loads of outbuildings. Unfortunately, uh, the gentleman who used to live in the house passed away last year, and it's fallen into a bit of rack and ruin. Uh, but uh, and the heating is off and the water is off, so it's not in particularly good condition inside. And I do believe it's all gone to probate and something like that. So a little bit of a mess really, but uh, the place, it starts off, uh, I walked around with a lady and we actually, I said, well, you've actually got more than one, one grey squirrel. You've got about, I've seen seven. So if you've seen seven, there's probably going to be double that. Uh, but up to now, from the ones, one grey sighting, we've actually had 35. Uh, which is a lot and I do there's a couple left which are very very cagey now and uh, they're obviously re thinking uh, what's happened to all my mates and I can't find them anywhere so uh, when they see anybody knocking about now they're on the toes straight away so we have to have a little bit cagey catching those right we'll just do the same again go and check a camera go and check a feeder a little walk around and uh, see where we are with everything. Right, this is another one of the little, uh, one of the hides overlooking a, a feeder. It's what I call more of a natural hide. You can see where the tree's falling down. This uh, rudder's engine got took down with the winds, so I've pulled that in front of it. All this works out really well. Go overlooking that without being seen. Add a bit of sponge onto the tree, so they've got the gun in there, so we're not scratching it. Not uh, and it gives a nice, I find if, you, if you're resting your gun on sponge, it sort of sinks in a little bit and it stops any additional movement. You put it on a, on a bare branch, and there's always that slippiness. Put it on that and it sinks in and holds it. So, this is what I would call a natural hide. This is one of the feeders, feeder number 64. That's not been touched, uh, which is a good thing because there's no reds in here, which means the greys are not coming to this, which means we've got on top of the numbers. Uh, so we'll see, we'll just keep monitoring this, see what happens. I've not got a camera on this, uh, but you can tell as it's been because the feed, what I do with my feed, I flatten it to the top and make it flat. So if a squirrel comes in, you can see it's dug it out. You can see a hole in the middle. Then you, you know if something's been there. This is another sign. See the dirt on the top? This is from when there were a few squirrels in here. The squirrels come in, they lift it up the head. And that's the colour off the top of the squirrel's head. Now that looks as if it's a red squirrel, but it's not. I guarantee you there's no squirrel, red squirrels in here yet. But the plan is to get them in here. But when you see that, that means the squirrel's going to lift it up the head to get in there. Next one. Right, and if you can pick that up up there, the top of the tree tops, that's a squirrel dray. Uh, that's what the, uh, the squirrels nest in generally. Not always, sometimes they'll nest within the ivy in certain trees. You'll see behind us there's ivy in the trees nesting that. Sometimes they hollowed out trees. Uh, but generally, that's, if you see those, that's a, that's a, a squirrel dray. Obviously, it's a grey dray on this area because there's no reds, but reds and greys have been known to share them. One will vacate, one another one will move in. They also have two different ones. They'll have a summer dray and a winter dray. 
Now, when I first came to this place, there was graves all around this place. They're feeding the floor, there's in the trees. Uh, and I've actually basically I've flattened those now. Uh, and I think it's probably just one left, which is, as we saw, the feed has not been visited. So we know there's not many in, in this area at all. If any, I think the, the two that's left at the far side, uh, but we'll catch up with those eventually. Like I say, that's a squirrel's ray. Uh, it's quite high, usually, usually not as high as that, but uh, it's definitely dry because uh, early on the year, early on uh, this year, uh, and late on last year, I actually saw a couple of greys in and out of that, which are uh, no longer with us now. If you look at this, uh, you, you get close up to this and see the actual root base of this tree that's gone over. Actually, looks like a mangrove. Uh, fantastic looking thing. It's just every time you look at something, you see something different, and it's just like like a labyrinth of little caves and little holes, and there's various things we've been living in here. There's mice and insects, and it's just just awesome, just awesome. Yeah, All right, this is another hide I've built on here. This is uh, this is not a natural hide. I've used two tree trunks, small trees. I've got a couple of branches between them both. That one's in just for stability, but it's also there to create more stability for the shot. You've got something to rest the elbow. You can have a supporter shot, take a supporter shot every time. Uh, also look for something, a tree, a branch, a gate, anything just to support the shot and get the shot 100%. Uh, like I say, a couple of little branches across got some sponge again on here to protect the gun and to make the, the, the shot a little bit more stable some old army camo netting thrown about across there and uh, little people still there and when you look from across there looking this way you've got this in the back of you the road engines making everything all blend in and you cannot uh, you can see from there but if you can imagine if you're looking right 40 40 yards away you're not going to see anything. I've also sprayed this with some camo paint, but it's, it's coming off now, so I'm probably have to put some tape on that. I also got myself a little chair to make it feel like home from home. Right, here we are, feeder 62. And this is where I figured the last two squirrels are hanging out. And sure enough, they've been here. You can see the, the feed's all dragged to the front. They've been feeding on here. You can see they've been lifted over the head, all the monkey markings from the top. It looks like it's a red, but it's not, it's grey. There's no reds in here. So, I'm now satisfied, I'm quite happy with the fact that I can come and spend whatever time's needed and get the squirrels because they're coming to this feeder. Uh, the digging show that. And once I check the, the, inf the intel from the, from the trail cam, that'll tell me the exact times and I can work around that and we'll, uh, we'll get these last two nailed off. Job's a good one. Right, regarding times of day to shoot the squirrels, uh, it's generally well known that it's first thing in the morning, dusk and dawn, uh, and last thing at night. Uh, but having said that, I've been on permissions where I can shoot all day all day long, uh, constantly, as they keep coming in. But usually the rule of thumb is, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, uh, and that, that is the generally best time for them to feed. Uh, and this can all be backed up and checked if you've got trail cams on the job. Uh, I was checking some last night, uh, the earliest ones was 7.34, which is still quite dark and it was actually filming in black and white on the trail cam. And the last one was 17.14, which is again, it, it, it was dark, uh, but it was just picking up as a, a black and white image through the trail cam. So first thing in the morning, last thing at night, at a general place, general times to be on top of the squirrels. But they will feed throughout the day, especially if you're providing good feed for them. And if there's a lot of them to compete, then they will need to feed uh, in between the others feeding. So yeah, first thing you like, first thing in the morning, last thing at night. Right, at the end of the day, uh, part of my normal day out here, 
I'll come round, I'll just check the other parts of the farm, which is probably non squirrel related, but like there's a little barn here where we've done some feral shooting before. Uh, we've had a good job on them, but they'll come back, so I'm just going to check that out, see what's in there. A uh, little word on the kit we're using. Uh, thanks to Thomas Jakes for the, the loan of the, the C50 Digix uh, night vision scope. Uh, worked perfectly well in daytime for getting the squirrels. The XQ35 LRF Axion uh, Spotter, another absolutely essential bit of kit. Uh, works really good hand in hand with, with, the, with the night vision scope. And the rifle, quite a bit to say about the rifle actually, it's the Air Arms S510 Tactical uh, in 2.5 FAC. It's a superb rifle. I really love the tactical stuff as you know and it's worked really well. Since the day I've had it, it's working really, really well. It's also up for the British Shooting Show Awards uh, as the best air rifle. Uh, narrowly missed out last year, uh, so appreciate it. If you want to vote for them, I voted for it myself today. Uh, so just check out the website if you're on Facebook or any of the social media platforms. There's various links to the Shooting Show Awards. Uh, give them a vote. Uh, it's a well worth, well worth the effort and what a great company to, uh, to be associated with. And, uh, and obviously not forgetting the Audible S Superdome pellets uh, in 2.5, uh, been working superbly well in the, uh, in the S510 tactical. Right, I'm just going to check out this little barn here, this old barn for some ferals, uh, and then uh, when I've done that, the day's over, and we're going to head home for some dinner. about 20 in there uh, there's a couple left in there up the rafters but uh, I'm going to come back in with a sub 12 uh, night vision or the uh, or the torch and uh, that lamp sorry and we'll take care of them that way thermal spot is a good 20 in there uh, all flying out through the window not going too far but uh, excellent looks like another feature there for somebody Right, then it was another successful day. The rain's come in, the wind's come in, and so we're back home in the warmth. Uh, thanks for watching, appreciate it. We'll see you uh, next month on the next video. And uh, I'm just gonna tuck into this delicious meal. See you later.